This is the FDOT's webinar-based course on the Introduction to Flexible Payment Design. The intended audience for this course is new payment design engineers. The main objectives of this course are gaining a basic understanding of some of the common terms, variables, and guidance used in payment designs, to learn the general process of performing a payment design, whether it's a brand new design or a rehabilitation, and also to provide an overview of how to assess existing payment condition in order to come up with an appropriate strategy for rehabilitation. Here's the outline of this course. Very generally speaking, our course mimics the order of the Flexible Payment Design Manual. We will start out with just some introductory things such as high-level discussion of payment design and then go over some terms and definitions. This information is mostly from chapters 1 and 2 of the manual. Module 2 will discuss all the different offices that you'll need to coordinate with in order to start a payment design. This comes from Chapter 3 of the manual. Module 3 introduces you to the department's friction course policy and will describe when and where to use open graded friction course versus dense graded friction course. You'll find this information in Chapter 4 of the manual. Modules 4 through 7 are where we will dig into the various design processes for new construction, widening, rehabilitation, and shoulders. These modules coincide with chapters 5 through 8 of the manual. And finally, Module 8 will discuss what needs to be included in your payment design package, which is generally found in Appendix B of the manual. So let's begin Module 1. In this module, we will discuss the general principles of payment design, and then we will go over some terms and definitions. First, let's look at some good reference materials. These are the main documents you'll probably use during the payment design process. We've already shown you the Flexible Payment Design Manual. The design equation used in our manual comes from the 1993 AASHTO Guide for the Design of Payment Structures, so that's why you may hear our design method called the AASHTO 93 method. And the FDOT standard specifications for road and bridge construction is a really good thing to be familiar with during your payment design. Although the spec book is really the rules for the contractor to construct the road, it's important to understand how the pavement will be installed. Things such as lift thickness need to be a consideration in your design. The Turnpike has some specific requirements for their facilities, so if you're doing work for them, you'll need to be sure to review the payment design requirements in the Turnpike Design Handbook, the TDH, and the general tolling requirements, the GTR. So you see that we've included hyperlinks to each of the FDOT documents here. We did not include a link to the AASHTO document because that's something that isn't available for free online. If you want the book, you'll need to order it from AASHTO. You don't necessarily need it to do a payment design here in Florida, but it's a very good resource. So now let's look at payment types. There are two types of payment, flexible and rigid. Flexible payment refers to asphaltic concrete pavement, which we usually just call asphalt or AC. Rigid pavements are concrete pavements, and we usually refer to those as just concrete pavement or sometimes JPCP, which stands for Jointed Plain Concrete Pavement. Due to the flexibility of asphalt, a higher stress distribution is produced on the subgrade. Therefore, we need to use high quality materials near the surface due to the higher stresses. Alternatively, concrete pavement has a high rigidity and a high modulus of elasticity, so it relies more on the concrete slab than the subgrade for structural support. In other words, the concrete spreads the load over a large area and keeps pressures on the subgrade low. The different stresses and how they're distributed are the primary reason why flexible and rigid pavements behave differently and therefore require different design procedures. Now we'll go over our terms and definitions. First, we'll discuss some general payment terminology and then get into more specific terms related to the payment system itself. We'll also go over some operational terminology, including some traffic information as it relates to payment design. And finally, we'll go over the AASHTO design equation and look at each of the terms in the equation. So let's start with the basics and look at the materials that make up flexible pavements. The first ingredient is asphalt cement which is referred to as AC or binder. The most common source of AC is a byproduct of the refining process of crude oil that produces gasoline, diesel fuel, and other petroleum products. Hot mix asphalt, which is also referred to as HMA, is a method to produce asphalt, and it's the one most commonly used in Florida. It combines AC, aggregates, and air in high temperatures and produces asphalt. 
Mix design is a balancing act to find the optimum percent of each ingredient to produce a mix that provides strength and stability, rut resistance, but also durability, crack resistance. Too much binder in the mix could result in rutting, while too little binder would result in cracking. So think of mix design as your recipe for flexible pavement, and the AC, aggregate, and air are the ingredients. Binders come in different forms. We have performance grade binders, which are quite common, such as PG67-22 or PG76-22. Asphalt rubber binders, or ARBs, are mixtures of binder and ground tire rubber. Polymer modified asphalt, PMA, is a binder that is chemically modified by adding different types of polymers. And high polymer binder, HP, is a type of PMA with a much higher amount of polymer added to the binder. Each of these examples are considered to be a modified binder, except for PG67-22. Modified binders are generally used for higher performance or higher volume roads where we need a little extra resistance to rutting or cracking. An AMI is an asphalt membrane interlayer. You may have heard this called ARMI in the past. Now we simply call it AMI. So an AMI is a reflective crack treatment that uses a modified asphalt spray application with a layer of aggregate placed on top of it. The cover aggregate normally consists of number six stone, slag, or gravel, so a layer thickness of one half inch may be used. AMI is placed underneath the new asphalt layer to resist the stress and strain of reflective cracks and delay the propagation of the cracks through the, to the new pavement. An AMI layer has no structural value. Now let's talk about performance grade of the binder. The PG you see in front of the type of binder stands for performance grade. The PG describes the expected pavement performance based on the climate where it's installed. The numbers listed with the PG are temperatures in degrees Celsius. The high number shown is the average seven day maximum pavement temperature where rutting occurs, and the low number is the minimum temperature when cracking occurs. The maximum temperature value is an average because asphalt tends to rut after a period of time or more than one day. Conversely, the minimum temperature is a single value rather than an average. This is because the low temperature value represents when thermal cracking will occur. Since cracking happens instantaneously, we're only concerned with that minimum temperature that will cause the instantaneous crack. FDOT's standard asphalt binder grade is PG67-22, which means the binder should be rut resistant up to temperatures of 67 degrees Celsius and crack resistant down to temperatures of minus 22 degrees Celsius. Another thing I want to point out is that a binder is considered to be a modified binder when the difference between the high temperature and the low temperature is 92 or more. So as an example, if we take our PG76-22 binder, we see that the difference between 76 and minus 22 is 98, which means this binder is modified. PG67-22 has a difference between the high and low temperature of 89, so this is not a modified binder. Now let's go over the two main mix design methods. There are several different mix designs, but these two are the ones that Florida has predominantly used. First, there is the Marshall mix design, which is sometimes referred to as the Marshall method. It was developed by a man named Bruce Marshall in 1939. It was used in Florida up until the mid-1990s when SuperPave was adopted. SuperPave stands for Superior Performing Asphalt Pavements, and it came about as a result of the Strategic Highway Research Program, or SHRP, in the late 80s and early 90s. Since Florida started using this in the mid-90s, the majority, if not all, of our roads today have been designed using a SuperPave mix. The main difference between the Marshall Method and SuperPave is the fact that SuperPave uses performance-based criteria for asphalt mix design. It considers the material properties of the asphalt in the aggregate. So by defining the material requirements in the mix design, we will see a direct correlation to the performance in the field. Adopting the SuperPave mix design caused us to improve our specifications. As a result of the use of the SuperPave gyratory compactor that could simulate the loads associated with higher traffic volumes, as well as the SuperPave aggregate consensus properties, mixes in Florida were significantly stronger and were much less likely to rut. In order to measure our pavement performance, we conduct pavement condition surveys on an annual basis on all of our state roads. Every lane mile gets rated each year. So just to tell you a little bit about our pavement condition survey, 
First of all, we've been collecting pavement condition data on our roads since the mid-70s. We rate all of our roads for crack, rut, and ride. On a scale of 0 to 10, with 0 meaning the road is falling to pieces and 10 being brand new pavement, we consider anything lower than a 6.5 to be deficient. So according to Florida law, 80% of our state roads in Florida must have a rating of 6.5 or higher as determined by our annual condition survey. I should also note one caveat to the rating system is that if you have a road with a posted speed of 50 miles an hour or less and it has a ride rating between 5.5 and 6.4, it is also considered to be deficient, even if its other ratings are 6.5 or higher. These details and more information are found in Chapter 27 of FDOT's Work Program Instructions. So where we are now after all that history and all the upgrades to our mixes, specifications, QC efforts, funding, and condition monitoring, we're seeing pavements that last on average 14 to 19 years. In general, we're seeing our dense graded asphalts last for 18 to 20 years before they're deemed deficient and require milling and resurfacing. And for our open graded mixes, we're typically seeing them last 13 to 15 years. Now let's get into some payment system terminology, and let's start with the general structure of a flexible payment system. The top layer of asphalt is the friction course, which uses selected aggregates and produces a skid resistant surface. The next layer down is the structural course, which is the major structural component of the payment structure. This layer is designed to distribute traffic down to the base course. The structural course may be one or more layers of asphalt mix, depending on your traffic loads. Underneath the structural course is the base course, whose major function is to provide structural support to the payment system. The base extension noted here is just additional support for the transition area between the main travel lanes and the paved shoulder, and then between the paved shoulder and the grass shoulder. Finally, the bottom layer of our pavement structure is the stabilization. This is the soil underneath the base material. It's typically either the existing soil or fill material that's been brought in on site. This layer is compacted to a specific density requirements in order to provide the bottom layer of support for the payment structure. So starting from the top of the payment structure and working our way down, let's look first at the friction course. The purpose of friction course is to provide a skid resistant riding surface for vehicles. There are two general types of friction courses currently in use by the department, dense graded FC 9.5 and FC 12.5 and open graded FC 5. Friction courses FC 12.5 and FC 9.5 are dense graded mixes. These friction courses provide smooth riding surfaces with adequate friction numbers for skid resistance. FC 12.5 can be placed in lifts at thicknesses ranging between 1.5 inches to 3 inches. FC 9.5 may be placed at 1 inch to 1.5 inch thick lifts. However, I should note that 1 inch lifts are not generally the most desirable thickness due to constructability concerns. If you can adjust your payment design without changing your overall resurfacing thickness and use a one and a quarter or even one and a half inch lift, that's preferred. The one inch lift of SC 9.5 tends to cool quickly in the field, which could make compaction difficult. However, there may be instances where the one inch lift of FC 9.5 is the best solution. On some projects, this thinner lift may allow room for additional structural or overbuild lift, as in some curb and gutter sections without milling into the base or overlaying friction course into the gutter. The bottom line is to use prudent judgment and keep construction considerations in mind as you're doing your design. Our other friction course, FC5, is an open graded material and is only placed in a single 3 quarter inch thick lift. FC5 provides a skid resistant surface and the open graded texture of the mix provides for the rapid removal of water from between the tire and the pavement to reduce the potential for hydroplaning at higher speeds. One thing I should note about FC5 is that we do see some performance issues in some locations, such as turnouts and intersections of lower speed roads, so we limit the use of open graded friction course to high speed facilities. The slow stopping and turning movements cause this particular friction course to get shoved. Next, let's look at our structural course. Again, we adopted the super paved mix design back in the 90s, and now the following structural courses are used by the department. Structural course type SP 9.5 uses a 9.5 millimeter or 3 eighths of an inch nominal maximum size aggregate. Type SP 12.5 uses a 12.5 millimeter or 1 half inch nominal maximum size aggregate. And type SP 19.0 uses a 19 millimeter or 3 quarters of an inch nominal maximum size aggregate. 
As you can see here, the SP and the names of our structural courses indicate superpave. You can see here some examples of some of our older mixes that have since been replaced by superpave. You may see some of these payment types listed in the payment coring reports. Structural course is also used for areas of overbuild, which we'll talk about more on the next slide. In our standard specification, section 334, is the section on superpave asphalt concrete, which is our structural courses. Overbuild is a layer, or could be multiple layers, of structural course asphalt that is used to correct a deficiency with either longitudinal grade, cross slope, or super elevation of the road. Although overbuild is constructed using structural course asphalt, we do not assign any structural value to it. Standard specifications give some overbuild requirements for contractors that sh we should be aware of during the payment design process. Section 334-1.4.2 tells us that overbuild layers must be type SP asphalt concrete designed at the traffic level as stated in the contract documents. So now we know that the asphalt used for overbuild can and should be the same as the structural course that we use on the rest of our project. Section 334-1.4.2 also tells us that we are allowed to taper overbuild layers that have variable thicknesses, so areas that may be within the super elevated limits of a curve. They can be tapered down to a zero inch thickness as long as we place a one and a half inch layer of dense graded mix on top of the variable thickness overbuild layer. And finally, section 334-5.1.2 of the standard specifications tells us that density testing is not required for overbuild courses. So while these things from the specifications don't directly impact our payment design, we need to be aware of them as we make decisions for our project. The limits and quantities of overbuild will need to be detailed in the roadway plan set. Chapter 306 of the FDOT design manual provides one example of how this may be shown and quantified. The base course provides structural support to the payment system. The base course is a course of a certain material and design thickness which supports the structural course and distributes the traffic loads to the subbase or subgrade. In payment design, we do not typically specify what type of base material to use. Instead, we identify which base group should be used. This allows the contractor the full range of base materials so that the least costly material can be selected, thus resulting in the lowest bid price. There are some instances where a specific base material of asphalt base should be called for in the design. These instances include high groundwater and back of sidewall grade restrictions that make it difficult to obtain adequate design high water clearance from the bottom of a thicker lime rock base. Construction expedient, such as in urban areas where maintenance of access to adjacent businesses is critical to the extent that it is desirable to accelerate base construction. The configuration of base widening and subgrade soil conditions are such that accumulation of rainfall in excavated areas will significantly delay construction. The standard specifications has an entire chapter dedicated to base courses. This is included in sections 200 through 295. The section you'll most likely use is section 285, which is the optional base group section. So let's take a look at optional base groups. So here's a little bit of information about optional base groups. These are different base course materials that may have different thicknesses, but are structurally equivalent, and they are grouped together to form an optional base group as shown in this table. So in a payment design, you might call out the use of optional base group nine. The contractor would then look at this table and select a material with a specified thickness from base group nine. As an example, reading across optional base group nine, we can see that 10 inches of lime rock base, which has a structural number of 0.18 per inch, provides a total structural number of 1.8. Likewise, 12 inches of graded aggregate base, which has a structural number of 0.15 per inch, will yield a total structural number of 1.8. So here's what it would look like in our plan set on the typical section sheet. We include our payment design here and provide thicknesses for our friction course and structural course and simply call for optional base groups with no thickness specified. So in this example here, we call for optional base group 9 for the travel lanes and optional base group 1 for the shoulders. The stabilized subgrade is a structural layer that is 12 inches thick and it serves as a working platform to permit the efficient construction of the base material. It's generally bid as Type B Stabilization LBR40, 
with the contractor selecting the approved materials necessary to achieve the LBR 40 value. So if you're wondering what an LBR is, it stands for Lime Rock Bearing Ratio, and it's a lab test used to determine the bearing value of soils when they are compacted at different moistures ranging from the dry to the wet side of optimum moisture. It's used for evaluating lime rock and other soils used for base or stabilized subgrade material in Florida. The specification for stabilization is found in section 160. Now let's go over our operational terms. New construction is a completely new pavement system on a brand new alignment. Reconstruction is when we completely remove the pavement structure from the friction course down to and including the base layer. This would be done where there is something wrong with the base material and failure has occurred. Rehabilitation is repairing a road to bring it back to a condition of structural and functional adequacy. This is commonly done through milling and resurfacing. Widening could mean a thin amount of widening, known as trench widening, which is typically done in areas where we have lanes that are less than 12 feet wide, so we want to go out there and add a couple of feet of pavement. The widening is also where we add a complete new lane or add turn lanes for operational type projects, which improve the traffic flow of the facility. Resurfacing is the improvement to the structural condition of the existing roadway. Milling is the process of removing the existing asphalt by using a milling machine, which has a rotating drum with teeth used to grind off the existing material, and it can be set to a specific depth and cross slope. Overlay is simply laying down new lifts of asphalt to repair deficiencies in the existing pavement, and it may or may not be done in conjunction with milling. And now let's quickly define what we mean when we say operational type projects. These projects typically only have a length of a thousand feet or less, so they're relatively small. Examples would be turn lanes, skid, skid hazard projects, intersection improvements, or bridge replacements that include a short piece of pavement on either approach. So if you hear us refer to operational type projects, these are typically what we're referring to, small scale projects that help to improve the safety and the traffic flow. Now we need to go over a little bit of traffic terminology before we get into the design equation for flexible pavements. Traffic is basically your ultimate load on your structure, so it's one of the most important concepts to understand in pavement design. Traffic loads that are applied to a roadway, in addition to some other factors like climate, will determine the design life of your pavement. We design our pavements to withstand a certain amount of accumulated traffic loading over a certain period of time, the design life. So how do we get our traffic loading data? We start with the annual average daily traffic, otherwise known as AADT. This is simply the total volume of traffic along a stretch of road over the course of one year, divided by 365 days. Our AADT values come from more than 7,000 traffic monitoring sites statewide. Our traffic engineers can project future AADT values, which we can use to determine our accumulated traffic loads. But now let's think about what the traffic is made up of. It's not all one type of vehicle. We have cars, vans, pickup trucks, semi-trucks, buses, and so on. All these different types of vehicles have different loads associated with them. So how do we account for that in our payment design? We need a way to lump all those different vehicle loads together into a value we can plug into an equation. We use load equivalency factors to come up with equivalent single axle loads. So let's take a look. A load equivalency factor, which is sometimes known as LEF or E18, is a ratio of the number of repetitions of any axle load and configuration required to cause the same amount of damage as a single application of an 18 kip single axle load. The load equivalency factor converts a mixed traffic stream of different axle loads and configurations into a design traffic number. This is done by converting each expected axle load into an equivalent number of 18 kip single axle loads and then summing them up over the design period. This sum is our design equivalent single axle load, or design ESL. The AASHTO design equation that we will discuss in a few minutes refers to the design ESL as W18. The design ESL value represents an accumulation of loading over our design period, which can also be thought of as an accumulated damage. We design our pavements to withstand a specific amount of damage over a specific period of time. So when you're looking at your traffic data, you will calculate your design easel by subtracting the opening year easels from the design year easels. Appendix D of the Flexible Pavement Design Manual has additional information on estimating design easels. 
One thing I'll point out from Appendix D is Table D3, which is FDOT's equivalency factors for different facility types. You won't be able to find a direct correlation between these values and the load equivalency factors in the 1993 AASHTO guide. These values were developed and they are maintained by our State Transportation Statistics Office. So all this information on equivalency factors and ESOLs will allow you to have a better understanding of the information you get from the Traffic Engineering Office and the information you need to plug into the AASHTO design equation. Just to show you where the ESOL information is found for each project, let's take a look at the 18 KIP ESOL report that you'll receive from your planning office. The first page shows all of your project information, including which equivalency factor is used. The second page includes the ESOL calculations. As you can see in the table, we have calculated ESOLs for each year, and also a tally of the accumulation of ESOLs beginning at the opening year through the design year. And you can see at the bottom of the table we have two values, one of which is the design ESOL, which is noted as the opening to design year ESOL accumulation, and it's shown in units of one thousands. So the ESOL shown in this particular example is 1,543,000 ESOLs. This means that it's predicted that this section of roadway will experience around 1.5 million 18 KIP ESOL applications between the opening year of 2022 and the design year of 2042. So now that we know all about ESOLs, let's take a quick look at traffic levels. These are based on the design ESOLs for a project. You can find this information in a couple of places in the Flexible Manual. It's first shown in Chapter 2 in the section that discusses the AASHTO design equation and its variables, which is Section 2.2.1. It's also repeated in Chapter 5 in its own section, 5.6.5, which is titled Traffic Levels. Here is the 1993 AASHTO design equation for flexible pavement. You can find it in the Flexible Pavement Design Manual in Chapter 3 in Figure 3.1. All of the variables in this equation are defined in Chapter 2 of the Flexible Manual. As you can see here, there are several variables, including the structural number, which is boxed out in green. This is what we want to solve the equation for. So let's look at each of the variables and constants in this equation. The structural number is the unknown variable to be determined. It represents the strength of the pavement needed for your project-specific combination of soil support, design easels, terminal serviceability, and environmental conditions. The W18 variable is just a different notation for the 18 KIP design ESOL, which we already discussed. This value will be project specific and it comes from the 18 KIP ESOL report provided by your planning office. The standard normal deviate is the logarithmic form of the reliability value. Chapter 4 of the 1993 AASHTO guide is dedicated to reliability, and in that chapter there are several definitions of reliability. The one that's most suitable for this training states that reliability is the probability that a pavement section designed using the process, the process being the design equation shown at the top of this slide, will perform satisfactorily over the traffic and environmental conditions for the design period. Selecting higher reliability values will result in thicker pavements. You can find our design range values for reliability in Chapter 5 of the Flexible Manual, specifically in Table 5.2. These ranges are based on facility type and also on project type, and for a single project, you should only select one reliability value. So as an example, if you have a project where you're milling and resurfacing the existing lanes and also adding a new lane, which reliability value would you choose? Since the project includes rehabilitation of existing pavement and also addition of new pavement, it seems that we have two columns to choose from for our project. In this situation, if you feel that the lower end of the range for rehabilitation is appropriate and the upper end of the range for new construction is also appropriate, then select the value that's in both columns, 95 for limited access or 90 for urban and rural arterials. If you happen to have this situation on a collector, you should use your best judgment and either select a single value or justify the use of two different reliabilities in your payment design package. I should also note that if you select a value that's outside of the range of one of these columns, that's okay. For example, let's say you have the same project that we were just discussing with the new construction and the milling and resurfacing, and let's say it's an urban arterial. If you wanted to use a reliability of, say, 95 for the whole project, that's okay too. This just needs to be explained in the payment design package why the value of 95 was selected. The next variable to discuss is the standard deviation, which is the combined standard error of the traffic prediction and the performance prediction. The department uses a constant value of 0.45.
The resilient modulus is a project-specific value for the strength of the in-situ soils that your payment structure will sit on. The resilient modulus value is provided by the State Materials Office for every project. I should note that there is a difference in resilient modulus values between those obtained through lab testing versus those obtained through deflection testing in the field. The field resilient modulus is typically a higher value than the lab resilient modulus due to these tests being performed under uh, different conditions as well as from additional compaction resulting from the construction of the road and the traffic loading applied through its life. Therefore, lab resilient modulus values should only be used for new construction or widening projects, and rehabilitation projects should use the field resilient modulus data in order to avoid overdesigning the pavement. The final variable to cover is the change in serviceability. To understand what this is, we need to first talk about the present serviceability index, initial serviceability, and terminal serviceability. The present serviceability index is a scale from 0 to 5, with 0 being the worst and 5 being the best, of the ability of the road to serve the traffic. Ashto describes this as a measure of the roughness and distress, with roughness being the main factor affecting the present serviceability index. Initial serviceability is the condition of a newly constructed road, and terminal serviceability is a condition of a road that has reached the end of its design life. Ashto suggests using a value of 4.2 and 2.5 for initial and terminal serviceability, respectively, and the department has chosen to use these values as well. So knowing our values of initial and terminal serviceability, we can calculate the change in serviceability, which is the difference between initial and terminal serviceability. So the value the department uses is 1.7. Some additional design-related terms to be aware of are shown here. There are a few different variations of the structural number. There is the required structural number, denoted with the subscript R, which we've already seen. This is the value that's calculated using the 1993 Ashto design equation for flexible pavement, and it's based on the resilient modulus, reliability, and design easels. Remember, our required structural number provides required strength of the total pavement structure, but we need a way to translate that into layers of asphalt, base material, and stabilization. That's where our calculated structural number, denoted here with the subscript C, comes in. This is the value we get from the equation shown here, which is the sum of our layer thicknesses multiplied by their layer coefficients. This equation needs to be greater than or equal to our required structural number. We'll talk more about this equation in just a minute. Next, we have our existing structural number, noted with the subscript E. This is the structural number of the existing pavement at the time of resurfacing. You can calculate the existing structural number by getting existing payment core and condition information from the materials office, and then using the same equation as the calculated structural number to determine the existing structural value of the pavement. I should note that the structural value of any pavement that will be milled out needs to be subtracted from the existing structural value because that pavement is being removed. We'll go into this in a later module. Finally, we have the overlay structural number. This is the structural value that is necessary to bring the pavement up to the project requirements. In other words, it's the difference between the required structural number calculated from the 93 Ashto design equation and the existing structural number. This will also be discussed in a later module. Layer coefficients are values that indicate the strength of certain construction materials used in the pavement structure. So layer coefficients are specific to material type. Table 5.4, which is in Chapter 5 of the Flexible Payment Design Manual, provides all the layer coefficients for use in new pavement designs. There's additional coefficients for existing pavements, but we'll take a look at those in a later module. Each one of these layer coefficients were developed through extensive research, so modifying or trying to create new layer coefficients is not advisable. In our equation, the D value refers to the individual layer thickness. Typically, we start from the top of the payment structure and work our way down to the subgrade with our layer numbering. So let's look at an example. So let's say we have a proposed payment design of 3 quarters of an inch of FC5, 4 inches of structural course SB12.5, using optional base group 9, so we'll assume 10 inches of lime rock, and 12 inches of type B stabilization. Some pretty typical values you might see. So those are all of our layer thicknesses. Next, we need to look at table 5.4 to get our layer coefficients for each layer. So you can see that FC5, our open graded friction course, does not have any structural value. Next, we look for our structural course, SP12.5, and we find it has a structural coefficient of 
so we'll multiply 4 inches by 0 0.44 for this layer. Next, our base group we decided to base our design on is lime rock base with an LBR of 100, which gives us a 0 0.18 structural coefficient. So that'll be 0 0.18 times the 10 inch layer thickness for the base. And finally, our stabilized subgrade will be a type B stabilization with an LBR value of 40. This corresponds to a structural layer coefficient of 0 0.08, which we multiply by the 12 inch layer thickness. Plugging all of those values into the equation will yield a calculated structural number of 4.52. The next step you would need to do is to compare this to your required structural number to make sure you're equal to it or greater than it. You don't want to exceed the required structural number by a lot because this would be a costly overdesign. But we need to at least be equal to it. If your calculated structural number is less than your required structural number, you need to make some changes to your payment design. You could try increasing your structural layer, or you could try selecting a higher base group. And our last term is design period, which is the design life expected for our pavement. The 93 Ashto guide provides a good definition in its chapter on reliability, chapter 4. It states that the design period is a period of time elapsed as initial or rehabilitated pavement structure deteriorates from its initial to its terminal serviceability. So in other words, it's the period of time associated with the change in serviceability, the delta PSI that we saw earlier. The department's standard design periods are found in Chapter 3, Table 3.1 of the Flexible Payment Design Manual, and they range from 8 to 20 years. Shorter design periods can be used if there are constraints such as curb and gutter, or scheduled future capacity projects that justify limiting overlay thickness. These reasons should be documented in the payment design package. This concludes Module 1, Introduction, Terms, and Definitions.